Welcome everyone to my very first interview of my new series called The Aliveness Habit. My name is Alexandra Howard. I'm the founder of Mind Mood Alive, a coaching practice uh, that helps people come alive in mind and mood so they can live in vibrant flow and ease every day. And uh, this interview series was, was born from a desire to just simplify and sort of demystify the experience of aliveness and, and crack the code on what it means to feel alive, for each of us to feel alive, and, and then just inspire some simple everyday habits and practices that can help us along. So this series matters to me personally because I feel that while we may all have a heartbeat and breath and we might be ticking off boxes every day, um, and those things might tell us that we are active living beings, it doesn't necessarily translate into feeling alive. And that's what I'm interested in exploring because I believe that's an essential human requirement for claiming a life that you love. So I can think of no better person than to uh, introduce my, my guest today, uh, Jason Dorland. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation, Jason. Um, Jason's life path is very, very colorful. He's a devoted husband and father. He, he's become a good friend of mine and a, and a colleague. Um, he's an athlete and uh, an Olympian having rode in the uh, 88 Seoul Olympics, after which he transitioned into the world of high performance coaching. He's an artist and a thought leader and a teacher and a writer en route to publishing his third book uh, this year. So Jason, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I love that you're here because I know that the journey, particularly your athletic journey, hasn't always felt alive for you on the inside. And so I think that, um, you know, you're, you're a perfect first guest uh, for me. And so I'm curious, I thought I'd just throw the question out there uh, for you. You know, how has the word aliveness evolved for you and what does that word mean for you today wow that's a biggie um but you know it's interesting you talk about the rowing piece because i you know i'm when i was a young teenage boy and i got into rowing and um it was a family thing my granddad my dad my older brothers so it wasn't expected but um but i did i followed all of those footsteps and and there was an aliveness to that, right? It, there was an excitement. Uh, and, you know, sitting in class all day long, just, <laughs> just waiting until even training, even through the winter, the dry, dry land training, I loved it. And, uh, and I felt alive because it, it was a community for me. Um, we were in many ways misfits because Rowing is uh, an uncomfortable sport and it attracts some strange cats and um, but we all found ourselves there and, and belonging to this really cool group and that in itself was a big draw and um, you know but then it got serious right then I got a scholarship to the States and there was expectation and then I got on the national team and there was incredible expectation. And then going to the Olympics in the men's eight as the defending Olympic champions from 84, the expectation was palpable. And, um, and so that's really when the aliveness, funny enough, fell out of it for me, right? And it rolling was really just a vehicle uh, to achieve what I was in pursuit of, which was the gold medal. And, and so when it became a chase, the aliveness died, for lack of a better term. And uh, yeah, so that's that's how I would have experienced aliveness in the sport, and so and so I retired afterwards because it just it, it wasn't something that br brought me any sort of happiness anymore. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I I love how you shared the uh, the community aspect that obviously was very palp palpable for you at the start. Did that did the the expectation and the um, the chase did that overpower that that community aspect did it, yeah. did it feel in community later on or uh, i think you know 
when you're a teenager, 16, 17, 18, those are big years, right? And I mm-hmm. think some of the some of the the boys that I met in that time um, were important to me at that time. Now, mind you, I'm still friends with a lot of the national team guys I rode with. But when you get on the national team, it's a different gig, right? That they they be your teammates become your competitors mm-hmm. yeah. it, at a very high level. And so because of how I was raised or coached to perceive competitors, i.e. the enemy, in times of selection, these teammates became the my enemies. And so it was a, a constant uh, switch between friend and foe in my mind. And, uh, and that was exhausting and proved ultimately to be toxic. And so I just... Uh, yeah, the community wasn't as tight. There's yeah. just no way it was. It shifted. It turned into sure. something. It turned yeah. into something um, different and something that actually, in fact, was killing your aliveness and not. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't aware of that at the time, but in sure. reflection, in reflection, yeah. that uh, I would say that's an honest assessment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, what does that mean? How, what does the word mean for you today? Well, you know, I've still found aliveness in rowing. Like when I got into coaching, um, my second iteration, my first iteration, it was it was just an extension of my athletic career where winning was everything. And I was a toxic coach, quite honestly. But when I came back to it um, with a different perspective, with a view as um, it was about the athlete, not about me, I was in service of those athletes. I was journey centric, athlete centric. It was just a complete 180 from what I had, from who I was as an athlete. And in that shift, the aliveness came back. The allure wasn't winning anymore. It was, I got such a buzz out of um, working with these young boys, right? And watching them, watching lights go on and watching them achieve things that they didn't think they could. Um, and then the community of that, you know, as, uh, I was, I guess when I got into that thirties, forties, and I don't know, there's something so mischievous and, and lovely and attractive and beautiful and awkward and about hanging around teenage boys. It's just such a bizarre age, right. For many of them, because they're inappropriate and they're egocentric and, you know, it's just, it's, uh, but and they're insecure but they're beautiful right they're just beautiful they're in process right they're they're figuring it out and and to have the the privilege of being of having an impact on that figuring it out that was that's what brought me the aliveness in coaching right was was to be was to have the privilege of playing a role right of having them let you into their life that was that was being alive for me and yeah. now that I'm not coaching rowing anymore it is the one and only thing I miss right yeah so that's that's interesting so it's sort of like a, a being in service of of their growth of their sure. journey being sure. part of being a witness to it being a a part of that uh, of that journey for them is is obviously an area that you that you discovered and that you that you came alive in that space um yeah. What, what was that feeling for you? How did you know that you were alive? Well, I think, you know, very much like flow state, right? It's, mm. it's, um, it is that state where things are happening and there's synergy and, and it's just, everything's coming together and moving forward. And, um, you know, and as a creative, I, you know, there, there, there was a challenge, a creative challenge to rowing because, the technique of rowing is such that, um, you know, to get four or eight bodies doing the same thing or as close to the same thing at the same time requires a fair chunk of work, right? And so I saw that as a creative process. So my analogy was always in the fall, in September, you were handed a piece of clay and for the following 10 months, each day you got to come to that piece of clay and, and work it and, and make changes and take parts away and add parts to it. And, and then 10 months later, you, you sort of put it out 
as okay here this is what i've this is what i've worked on for 10 months or you know with these young boys and and that's an incredible creative process and so that was an allure for me as well right is what can i do with this i've got i've got eight or eight or however many boys very different bodies some of them different mindsets different approaches different reasons how do i work with them to 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 put them on point right and uh and so that, that was fun for lack of a better term it was just fun right yeah yeah absolutely i think the fun uh the fun aspect is often it's a very overlooked aspect of uh of the experience of aliveness yeah. and uh yeah i think that i think that you know the fun i don't know for whatever reason i mean it's kind of weird because we're so hard hardwired for play right. <laughs> it's sort of bizarre that right. it's the one thing that gets dropped right. from our process and from our experience and right. uh you know i I mean, it sounds like in your, in your experience, you sort of started out having fun and then, and being playful or whatever. And then it just sort of, it just shifted and changed and became something else entirely. And it sounds like it's that, you know, it's that chase. It's that it's when we land in outcome and we live in outcome and we live in that forward pace pacing state in our minds when we seem to get into the most trouble and where our aliveness just gets really, um, you know, really killed, really. Totally uh, fair. And, and I would say now, for me, it's an acid test. At this stage in my life, if fun isn't <laughs> part yeah. of it, then I'm out, right? Yeah, I'm out. Yeah, it, yeah and how do you know I, you're just, having fun, though? Right. What, is, what is that? How do I know when I'm having fun? Yeah. Just, uh, I mean, it's not a moment where I have to ask myself. I just, mm -hmm. it's just a feeling, right? You mm -hmm. know when you're a when you are, to use your word, when you know when you feel alive. At yeah. this stage of my game, I know what makes me feel alive. And and um, I just figure with the time I've got left, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend that time doing things or being with people who don't uh, give me that feeling, right? Who yeah. don't elicit that feeling in me of feeling alive. Sure. And part of feeling alive is is for sure having fun, right? Yeah. So, and, and where do you feel that you block your receiving that experience of aliveness in its entirety? Is there any, anywhere that you feel blocked in that? Well, I think, you know, that's a great question. I, I think, um, uh, you know, back to, back to our development, right? Our journeys. And for me, like all of us, I've got old stories. And, and so, you know, a lot of what allowed or what or what resulted in that initial fun or aliveness of rowing to disappear or transition, perhaps, was the focus on outcome, right? Winning an Olympic gold, gold medal became the focus. Yeah. And so what I find today, um, you know, that guy still lives in me. It's not like I got rid of him. He's still with me and he still loves the chase. And he still loves accomplishing stuff. But I find that when I hand the wheel over to him or when he wants to take the wheel, th that's when things can get prickly. And so mm -hmm. it's really just about having that self-awareness to know, okay, hold on a second. This is becoming, this is starting to mean more. Uh, this is, you know, the outcome of this pursuit of this endeavor is starting to mean more then it's engagement, then yeah. the practice of just being here. And when that starts to sway, that's when I'm able to sort of pull it back and refocus and go, hold on a second, here, right? Like yeah. I get where you're heading and I understand the allure of that, but let's not lose sight of, of the day-to-day -day of the practice. And so, yeah. you know, yeah, I get and because I fell so hard after Seoul, um, it's, an easy, <laughs> it's an easy reminder to, to go to, Okay, so you've this is a pattern, bud. And if you want to go down that road, fair enough. But uh, you know, you know from past experience that it didn't it didn't turn out all that well, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's an easy one for me. Yeah, sure. And what are some of the practices that you engage in in order to keep you centered in that 
in that space of aliveness for you. That's yeah, awesome. for me, for me, journaling is is being you know it's the like I Julia Cameron's the artist way when mm -hmm. Robin, who's my my wife and partner now. You know, when she gave me that book in 1997 and I first I poo pooed it as self-help garbage and kind of flaky and whatever. And uh, and again, that was a story. But um, when I got through, got past that and just got into this morning ritual of writing and then realizing uh, and appreciating what I was writing about and going, holy crap, I can't believe you! I just wrote that down. Um those were moments, right? And, yeah. um, and those moments allowed me to bring stuff up and process it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's still alive today. I mean, I wrote this morning, I write every morning. And um, yeah. I find journaling is for me, the most powerful self awareness tool that I have in my in my toolkit. Yeah. And I mean, meditation, I, we have a plant based diet, I, I watch what I eat, I spend time in the woods, I run, with, with we have dogs which is which are huge in terms of um just that piece uh working out spending time on my own is mm -hmm. a biggie mm -hmm. I, I love alone time yeah um yeah so th those are all little bits yeah and i i really love that you know i think everybody has to own their own process their own what works for them and i i know i mean that's really the essence of of the work that we do, right? It's just owning your own process right. and whatever, whatever that is in your toolkit or your menu of choice, um, everybody has the, the right, the, the privilege of, of creating that for themselves. Sure. And I, I often find that there's sort of one thing that is, that is like the non-negotiable and it sounds like it's the journaling for you, which is like the core, um, you know, the core practice that keeps you in alignment. Um, and, I often find in my own practice with my clients that, you know, journaling can be a really difficult thing to, to do if you're not into writing, you know, and yet it's so powerful. And I've often been asked the question, well, what do you write about? You know, what do you do? Do you, so I, I'm going to put the question out to you because I think these are like the nuances that might click for somebody. Like, what do you actually write about? Right. And I think you touch on an important piece is that you know, when same when we work with our clients, we put out all of these tools, and and people gravitate or attracted to certain pieces, right? And and some work for others. Like if I don't meditate for a couple of weeks, it doesn't impact me the way not journaling would impact me. So, right. yeah. so yeah. when I'm doing everything together, it's awesome. But the journaling one, what I find, um, and and we get that question too. You know, well, what the hell do I I'm going to sit down and write like what am I writing about and and that's the piece it's not like I'm writing anything that I'm going to put up as a blog or it doesn't have to be eloquent or deep or anything in fact there are times when and Julia Cameron used to invite people like I have no freaking idea what I'm writing about and I don't even know why I'm doing like you just write yeah and then doing that allows it creates clarity or room, if you will, for something else to surface and come forward. And it works every time. Like it just works every time. Or I, or I just step into a gratitude sentence or two about how something that happened the day before or that, or whatever that I'm grateful for, or even saying I'm grateful for Robin or Matea, our daughter or the dogs or, yeah. or my health or whatever. So just, I mean, and that can happen every day. There's nothing wrong with having a gratitude practice, but just just kicking into those gives room for other stuff to surface. And yeah. sometimes I go to the writing knowing that um, I, what I want to sort out, mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes I will, or sometimes something else will push itself onto the page, if you will. And uh, you know, sometimes I just never know what's going to come up. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think it's a really, really uh, powerful practice. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, yeah, I think it's, it's something that I, I always um, try and engage myself as well. I mean, I, I don't, I journal, but I don't write. I actually, um, I have a separate system uh, and little 
online thing that it's just for me, but I, I, I write it on my, uh, my computer. Okay. Um, but it's, it's just, it's like owning whatever works for you and just, just do that. And it's enough and it's right. And it's perfect. Right. And, And, uh, and you know, and my analogy is it's like going and having a coffee or a beer or mm -hmm. whatever, going Mm -hmm. for a walk with yourself. Yep. And this forces the conversation, right? Yeah. So it, it, Mm -hmm. it really allows you time to sit down with yourself and the neat thing is sometimes I catch my, you know, I'll be writing, writing, writing. And then all of a sudden I'm writing in the third person and, and I just go, holy crap, when did that happen? And, um, and that's always a really cool moment. And, um, hmm. and then I just rip up the paper and I throw it in the recycle bin and that's it. And, hmm. and by ripping it up, it also gives me the freedom to write about whatever the hell I want. Right. It's not like I I'm writing something and going, Oh shit, I hope nobody finds this. Yeah. Right. And so um, so that just gives me that added safety. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. So what what is it what's important to you about about being able to source, support and sustain your own aliveness? Uh, well, I guess it's, you know, for me, it's just about um, enjoying life. Right. So. Um, If I'm not feeling alive, then uh, that's a major red flag, right? And so what happens? What what is a Jason that's not alive? What is that? Who is that? (laughs) um, Well, he's flat. I know, I know that. And I've probably not experienced him as being flat as I have as much in the last, as I have in the last two years, right? Mm -hmm. Since all of the um restrictions and lockdowns and whatever you know there's been some flat days right and so um and so just just knowing that just recognizing it not making it mean there's something wrong with me or i'm broken or or what have you just just knowing that that's an ebb and flow Mm -hmm. of life and i'm i'm we're at a time in history where where it's flowing a little more than it normally does, right? And uh, and then just resorting back to those, uh, to my tools, writing about it in my journal, getting out for a run big time, changing my state or working out. Like I always find if I'm in those flat moments, doing something that I know will change my state, which is spending time with the dogs running on the trails, right? It, it like. I can't think of a time where I've got back from a run and not felt better. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think you touch on an interesting point because, you know, aliveness isn't necessarily the euphoric adrenaline no, inducing s- states that we, that we, you know, that we maybe associate with aliveness. There's right. that, that flat state that you also talk about. So long as you are in connection with that flat state and you're allowing that flat state to express itself, I think there's also um you know something to be said for for there to be a version of aliveness that can be expressed there as well no doubt and it's to me it's just information right Mm -hmm. it's it's uh like as long as we don't make it mean anything and we just Mm -hmm. go oh okay so i feel like i'm not i'm not rocking it today and why is that and am i okay with that can i just be with that and uh yeah and i've learned you know I've learned at this stage to, to, to just let it, let it do its thing. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a huge, you know, as you know, and, and I mean, it's, it's a, it's a big human challenge and, uh, and it's often what, what kills our aliveness and, you know, uh, blocks um, is that, that permit, it's like the permission to, to not feel or not be or not, experience what we're experiencing um yeah so um i think the practice of allowing uh for there to be all the full spectrum of experience to to be present at any given moment and and allowing that to be part of your experience of aliveness um yeah so i love i love that perspective well we're going to um wrap up our interview today and um i've so appreciated your your words and your wisdom and your perspectives. And uh, I just thought I'd, 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 I'd finish with a final question of, of what's one thing that you would like to people to know about 
the experience of aliveness or um, you know, what's, what's one, one thing that you'd like to um, leave us with today? Yeah, I think um, for me, when I get into trouble, it's invariably when when I'm uh, when I'm comparing, right? Mm. When I see my life versus others, and that can be a slippery slope, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I just don't know that anything I don't know that anything good ever comes out of comparison, right? In, so true. Um, and so it's just a. I think that's the piece, right? Is to, yeah. is to not buy into the into the comparison garbage yeah. and yeah. to know that okay, there's information in the lives of others. Like it's not to say that you write off what others are doing and the lives they're having and the things they're that you go okay, well, how did they do? Like there's information in that, but. Um, to compare is where we really get ourselves in trouble because it's all ego, right? And that's and that's where we get ourselves into trouble. So I think it's it's important to be aware of others and the lives of others and their strategies and their ways of being and all that kind of stuff, and and to and to take on and utilize what we what we think might work for us. I think all that's important, but the comparison piece is. Uh, yeah, that's a prickly. It's an aliveness killer. I think you it's betcha. at the top of the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually. Yeah. That's yeah, a buzz and it's kill if there ever it's was a one. total buzzkill, and it's but it's again, it's another one of those human challenges. It's yeah. so hard to stay out of that out of yeah. that bucket, but it's good to recognize it. So sure. yeah, I really appreciate you uh, sharing that because it's yeah. absolutely bang on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here for for sharing and uh, participating with me. And it's been a real pleasure, Jason. Thank you. You betcha. My pleasure as well. Thanks, Alex. You're welcome.